Hello, everyone. Could everyone take their seats and we'll get the meeting started. So hello to everyone here in Radnor and everyone watching on YouTube. My name is Jan Rush, I'm DVA president, and we've got some good stuff to cover tonight. We're gonna be talking a bit about galaxies. This beautiful image from Doug Lentz um, is part of the, uh, is gonna be submitted for uh, the Astronomical League's um, Spring Galaxy Challenge. And he was lucky enough to find three of the galaxies that are required in the same image. So three for one. Okay. So I wanna tell you a little bit about this challenge. It's, people are finding it a lot of fun. This, the, the Astronomical League, as you probably know, has programs that you can follow that are uh, can span a year or more in terms of the observing that you need to do to complete the program. So with something like the Messier program, um, you need to go through the different seasons in order to catch all the objects on that list. This is a special observing award, however, and it can be accomplished, it must be accomplished in a much shorter period of time. And I think that's what got people here excited. So the way it goes is you observe 10 of the 20 objects on the target list. You need to sketch or image those 10 objects that you've chosen. You do an outreach activity related to the galaxies, to, related, related to galaxies beyond the Milky Way. You submit the observation log, the outreach activity and sketches to the observing chair at the Astronomical League. And the observations have to be done between April 1st and June 15th, and then the submission by July 15th. And you are allowed to use um, GoToScopes. There's a link there for, um, for more information on the program. Yeah, that won't help the slides to advance. <laughs> okay. So here's some of the galaxies that you can choose from. Uh, these are the first 10. And you can see they are pretty dim, but they are also, there's a nice variety in the format of the galaxies to give you a view of uh, what's actually out there, to give you an, an overview of what's out there. And here are the remaining uh, galaxies on the challenge. Now, Tom decided to put together this very nice composite image. He's got 11 of the, of the 20 here. So you can see what vari nice variety there is. And he, he will be submitting images for the challenge. Al doesn't do or didn't do the images. He did sketching, Al and Perdi. So here's what, what a typical sketch would look like if you want to take the route of doing this challenge, but sketching. And you can see that um, there isn't a lot of detail in the actual galaxy, but it's good because you get a chance to capture the neighborhood. You get to show the other things that are in the field um, in your sketch, and it helps uh, learn where you are in the sky, it helps you learn where you are in the sky. So now I have the first two certificates to award in this challenge. Okay, it's only been open a little more than a month and we already have two certificate winners. And the first is John Langruber, who I should have introduced as our tech wizard today. <laughs> and I urge you to check out his video about observing galaxies on YouTube. That was his outreach portion of the award. And so I have an award certificate to give to George, George, John. <laughs> Mm hmm oh, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Jim. <laughs> so how hard was this, John? Oh, well, 
Um, I actually used that Dobsonian to do imaging without tracking or guiding. So it was interesting. Um, but I learned a lot and had fun. And you can get started without spending $5,000. So uh, give it a try. <laughs> and of course, our second winner is Alan Purdy. There's a surprise. And for his outreach, Al wrote a, a uh, column in the newsletter. So you can check that out. Yes. Congratulations. First of many for John. <laughs> Thanks, <so. laughs> So who's next? <laughs> I'll let you think about it a little while. <laughs> there we go. Wanted to remind you again, we have restarted the quarterly raffle. Um, that's going to be um, in um, our, our door prizes chair, Ken Kopplinger, is our uh, new, newly uh, um, appointed uh, head of door prizes. And he'll be setting up the raffle, raffle table in January and April and July and October. And, but you can bring your donations in any time at all. And um, any, any meeting that is, or any time that you see, see uh, members. So you can give them to me if Ken's not here or Ken if he's here. So we had a lot of fun last meeting at the at the raffle, and it'll be fun to continue. Also wanted to mention quarterly, star, I mean, I'm sorry, overnight star parties, which are in the offing for the next couple of months. We talked about some of these last month, but we have the York County Star Party, star party in uh, June 14th to 18th. The Cherry Springs Star Party is unfortunately sold out, but you can go to Cherry Springs at a non-star party time. That's just fine. And the Green Bank Star Quest, Star Quest in um, Green Bank, West Virginia. Then there are two other ones that weren't here um, last month. The Adirondack Astronomy Retreat, July 16 to 23rd. And of course, the Alcon Convention, in Baton Rouge, which is July 26th, 29th. For more information on any of these, you can uh, go online to the website. There'll be plenty of information of how you sign up or where to, where they where they are. And also, um, you're free to, uh, to check the newsletter. They're all in the newsletter as well. Up, upcoming public star parties. Well, we did get good weather for last month's um, Valley Forge star party, but we have another one scheduled for the 27th with the backup date of the 28th. And that's um, at Valley Forge Historical Park. Then we have another outreach event we, we need to recruit a couple of people for. It's the Radner's Great American Campout on June 3rd, and that's at the Willows Park, a nice park in Villanova. Um, now, this, this is a, a fun event because it's campers that are there doing lots of different activities. And among their activities, they'll come over to the, and look at the telescopes. And they're always very enthusiastic and fun. It's families and kids. Um, we, we get this wonderful facility here in Radnor um, at, at the good graces of the Radnor uh, Township. Um, and we like to give back to activities in Ram Radner as a way of saying thank you. So I hope some of you will join me in coming out for the that star party. Then we also have a, a star party at Temple Ambler. That's June 23rd with a backup date of the 26th. We also have volunteer buttons for any of these activities. So if you click on the activity, you'll notice there's a volunteer button over here. So 
you can, that's a way to tell the organizer that you will be bringing your telescope or your binoculars. And you can see who else is coming as well. So if you'd like to be to participate in any of these activities, check out the uh, check out check it out on the website and volunteer. Okay, now we have a couple of meeting reports. Brian, welcoming. We have a. Uh... Three new members this month, Caroline McGee, uh, Edmund Troya, and uh, Martha Paulette. And we have a returning member, um, Don DiGidio. Um, I came through as a new member, but I'm not, I know that Don's definitely not a new member. So uh, we also have uh, a battery donation. So if anybody needs a, a battery for a, a observing rig, uh, see me after the meeting. Thank you, Brian. Okay, Bill McGee, camping report. Okay, so last month we went to the uh, Big Dipper Lodge up in um, right down the street from Cherry Springs. And I want to at least show some of the pictures of the surroundings so you guys have an idea of what it looks like there. Next year we're looking to do another event up there in March. Um, so, okay, so this is me and if I can be able to get some. You can do this. Ah, there we go. Take the list shot. It doesn't look quick. Yeah. No. I'll see. All right. Okay, so here's the outside observing area. We actually have two fields we can use. But here on the right, uh, there's some light that comes off of uh, the little dipper lodge, actually, has a barn light out there. But provided if we have vehicles on the right, we can really cut down on that. It's not, it's not much of a nuisance if you have vehicles in the way. So it's out front, out front of the lodge. So actually, this is great. Um, you know, while we're out there observing, you can come back, just walk up the steps a little bit and still hang outside in a nice canopy and not have to. Um, you know, be bothering anyone else, but you're still outside, keeping your dark adaptation. This is the side yard. Um, back behind that fence, we've been, I, she said we could move, we could observe and um, park back there as well. So, yep, keep going through. Uh, this is the upstairs room. So, the upstairs, we had uh, just a twin and a double, or I'm sorry, queen. And then the view outside, so you can see the actual whole uh, field that we have here with, I think Gary's vehicle was behind the pavilion. That pavilion can actually uh, can have fires and stuff there, but uh, when we were up there on a rainy night, it was too windy to have a fire, unfortunately. <laughs> and then this, I just thought it was interesting. There's a stained glass by a bathtub. <laughs> An interesting, <laughs> unique. And then downstairs, uh, plenty of space for people. We have a big table to the right. We have a, a prep area for the kitchen. And then there's actually couches and uh, seats over there um, by a fireplace. And then there's two additional rooms over in the back. And, they, and this is the side view, so there's a little seating area here. So it's big enough. Hopefully, you guys will be able to join us on the next trip. Um, when we do this in March of 2024, hopefully it's good weather. and. Uh, Still looking into what we're going to do this fall. I haven't finalized that. If anyone has any good suggestions, I'm all ears. Um, but yeah, that's it. We're good, Jen. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Any other announcements? All right. This year, we're going to have uh, guest observing talks. Um, and this Today's talk will be given by Alan Purdy. It's in the same, same yeah. It's getting feedback. No, this works. This is it. There's the pointer. If you need really need a pointer for YouTube, this is not. 
I'll just pause right there. And uh, thank you. Can you try hitting that? Have a go. Thanks. You're right. Okay. All right, we're in May. <clears throat> That's uh, spring for us. Astronomically, uh, May and spring kind of relate to uh, galaxies. And there's more up there besides galaxies, as you'll see, but uh, we'll emphasize uh, some of the galaxies that uh, can be seen. Uh, galaxies come in all shapes and sizes and configurations. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, configurations that spell out some letters, uh, like May observant. But other times you might, in your wanderings, come across something like this that says, come up and see me sometime. <laughs> If you do see that, you're not hallucinating. It just means you just got bitten by the bug and uh, hold on to your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at this time of year, we've got the uh, winter constellations that are settling in the West. So if you have anything that you want to see there, uh, get it right after it gets dark uh, before they set too far. But uh, uh, almost due South are the... Uh, Spring constellations of Ursa Major, uh, Leo, and then coming up is uh, uh, Budis and uh, in Virgo. And we're going to uh, focus on what can be seen. Can the camera? Yeah. Ah, for oh, the camera. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> it's dark. <laughs> you can see. We want to focus in on 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 Virgo. And those of you who are familiar with the night sky or know how you can reach it uh, using the um, um, arc of the handle of the dipper going through Arcturus and then uh, uh, going straight down to Spica, which is the brightest star in, uh, in Virgo. So we're going to blow up uh, that region of the sky, uh, Virgo. And, um, uh, and once we connect the dots, we can see uh, 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 Spica on the bottom as the brightest star, and um, and the other stars make up the, the constellation. The there's one star I want to uh, uh, bring to your attention, and that's this one here. It's called Gamma Virginis, and Gamma is a nice double star. Uh, the two stars are about the same magnitude, uh, three point six. Uh, and uh, one star orbits the other in a 170 year period. And so sometimes it's close uh, and sometimes a little further away. Back in uh, 2005, the, uh, the two stars were really close together, maybe a half arc second. So they were a little, little hard to split. Um, but right now it, it's, a, it's a little better and easily split. Uh, to give you some uh, uh, another perspective on this double star, uh, back in 1995 when I first observed it, it was a little over uh, a two and a half, two uh, arc seconds uh, in uh, distance from each other. <clears throat> I had a hard time splitting that uh, at the, around 80 power. I had to double it to about 160 in order to see that that split. And as you can see from the graph back in 2005, uh, the stars were really close together and a little harder to split. I didn't try uh, doing it then. But let's uh, fast forward to 2023, and we see that the uh, distance now is a little over three R seconds. And that's an easy split. Uh, a few weeks ago at Green Lane, I was able to do it at about 55 power, and I showed John, and he saw it uh, too. So it's an opportune time to see a, a, a fairly easy to uh, observe and easy to find a double star. Now here's a, uh, a, a page from the Atlas showing a part of Virgo and, uh, and uh, some of the galaxies that we can see. Um, when I first uh, went into the uh, Virgo uh, group of uh, Messe objects, I was really hesitant about doing it. I kept putting it off and putting it off, thinking it really would get lost in a hurry. But I found that once I started, it wasn't that bad. And rather than star hopping, I was galaxy hopping. And, uh, and what we can see are uh, a few of the Messe objects. There's M60, who's got a nice little companion next, uh, nearby. 
uh, M60 is a uh, is a uh, type of galaxy, is an elliptical galaxy. Uh, moving over to M59, you can see another elliptical galaxy is a little more elliptical. Uh, there are sub classifications of elliptical galaxies depending on how round or how elliptical they are. If it's perfectly round, it's a zero. As it gets uh, more elliptical, the numbers get a little higher. But you may see that uh, classification in your wanderings around uh, the, your readings. We also got some spiral galaxies. There's M58 right nearby, um, M89, M90, another spiral, <coughs> M86. I'm going to be coming back to M86, M84, and uh, M87 in, in just a, a couple more slides. But we've got uh, a number of different types of galaxies there. Now, uh, 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 near the end, kind of take a step back and, and uh, describe what some of these are. It, nearby is M49 and uh, another spiral, M61. And not to um, forget this uh, very interesting object in Virgo. Uh, you may not think, oh, I can't see a quasar, but a quasar is a very distant, very bright galaxy, but just uh, so far away, just looks like a star. But this is one of the brighter gal uh, quasars that we can actually see. It's a little less than 13th magnitude, 12.9 magnitude. And it looks like a little star-like object in the, in the eyepiece um, or when you do image it. But what is more amazing is to think of that those photons that you just now captured were traveling a little more than 2 billion years before they reached your own eye. So that's kind of uh, takes you uh, back a little bit and gives you a little more uh, or inspiring experience uh, out in the field. So uh, try to uh, 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 snag it next time you're out and uh, looking in the Virgo uh, cluster. Uh, on the border of Virgo and Corvus, way right down the bottom is uh, M104. And uh, what I'm going to do is just blow up that area and show you how easy it is to uh, uh, star hop to it. So the bright star down uh, in the uh, lower uh, right corner is the northeast star in the uh, trapezoid of Corvus, the constellation. And uh, you put your finder on that and work up to an hour ahead of three stars that point to a wide triple star. And then they also point to a smaller grouping of triple stars, which is right near um, uh, M104. And then you put your, uh, your finder on that and then look in the eyepiece. And you may not see this Hubble type image, but you'll see a nice glow with a a dark lane uh, cutting across it. Visually, uh, the bottom part may be just a little bit fainter, a little harder to see than the top part, but you get the idea from this picture that the name Sombrero uh, Galaxy is, is quite appropriate. I want to bring to your attention a couple objects on the bottom of the picture. I'm going to be coming back to that in just a second. Now, if we had uh, infrared vision like this rattlesnake does, then we would be able to see in the infrared, uh, which we uh, humans can't. But if we were able to uh, have that vision and look at the Sombrero galaxy we, in, the, in the infrared, you see the infrared glowing uh, uh, ar around the, uh, the dust lane. But notice the two objects on the bottom that are uh, bright red, we saw them on a previous picture, they, uh, they're there. And uh, I'm gonna be coming back uh, uh, to that uh, on, on this uh, next slide. Uh, here's the, uh, a visual image of the Sombrero Galaxy and the two objects on the bottom that I highlighted are really two interacting galaxies. Uh, and if you blow them up, you can see the spiral arms touching each other as if they're in a very, slow cosmic dance. And they have a funny name, uh, 2A-MASX, and then the coordinates. 
MASX is the uh, two micron full sky survey extended catalog. Uh, those two galaxies are uh, maybe four times further away than the sombrero. The sombrero is about 30 million light years out. So those two guys are uh, a little further out. I checked the images of M104 on Frank Colosimo's website and uh, Dick Steinberg's website. And they do have those two uh, galaxies uh, in the image. So any of you who have images of M104, if you haven't done so already, go back and look and see if you've got these two, two guys. Just to the right of that, it looks like a little grouping of uh, triple stars. And actually that uh, uh, middle uh, object is really a satellite galaxy of the Sombrero is called the Sombrero Ultra Compact Dwarf Galaxy. A lot of galaxies have uh, uh, neighbors, dwarf galaxies. Uh, we've got a couple, and eventually they'll probably get gobbled up by the, by the larger guy. So again, if you have images, uh, take a look to see if you actually have that as well. Okay, uh, we can get really bogged down in, in getting all of these galaxies in the uh, in the Virgo cluster, but it's good to uh, you know take a step back and okay, what kinds of galaxies do we have? So basically we've got the spiral galaxies, which are uh, 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 tend to have young stars in the arms. Uh, they tend to be a little bluer in color. You may see some red areas where star formation is occurring. Uh, all indicating it's it's uh, there's a lot of activity going on, and spiral galaxies tend to be metal rich. That is anything heavier than helium is called a metal, and uh, so star formation and metal formation is is occurring. Um, the, uh, the spiral arms have gas and dust where the star formation is, is occurring. The uh, Nucleus of the spiral galaxy tends to be a little yellower and older uh, with, with the older stars present. We also got elliptical galaxies, which are uh, fairly older uh, comparatively. Uh, they're uh, foreign metals and you don't see much in the way of gas or dust uh, and it, not much in the way of uh, star formation going on there. As I mentioned before, the ellipticals come in different uh, classifications depending on uh, their actual shape. The more elliptical, then the higher their classification. Uh, if it's purpley round, then it's a E0. Okay, uh, as uh, Bill mentioned, uh, there was a field trip up to the area around Cherry Springs and Gary Trapezano took a, a nice wide field shot of uh, some of the galaxies that we find in, in Virgo. Uh, some of the Messe objects are part of what we call the Markarian's chain of galaxies. And this is a little less than three uh, degrees across and a little less than two degrees uh, in, in height. So it's a fairly wide field and that was a nice shot. I think what, 75 millimeter? 85 millimeter. 85 millimeter. 85 millimeter. Yeah, at F5 straight. Yeah. And uh, Gary was uh, kind enough to label some of the uh, galaxies there. And uh, we've got the Messe objects, uh, NGC's new general catalog, and some IC's uh, index catalog. Um, a, a member of the DVA who used to be uh, observing with us, Joe McCormick, I would ask him, do you want to see an IC object? And he said, I see no see. They're a little dimmer. So I always uh, laugh when I see an IC number and think of Joe. But as they say in infomercials, wait, there's more. <laughs> On this same picture, <laughs> a little over 300 more galaxies in the background, the PGCs, uh, principal galaxy catalogs. And so you meticulously labeled each one, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Through the magic of computers, they sure. But it, you can see how crowded the area is, uh, and they're going way back. They're, they're probably 16, 17th magnitude or something like that. Uh, 
back in a couple of centuries ago, uh, William Caroline and, and John Herschel cataloged a number of deep sky objects. Many of them were uh, uh, galaxies, but not all. Uh, there are a little over 2,400 uh, Herschel objects. Uh, almost uh, a sixth of them are uh, found in Virgo. So there are 356 Herschel objects uh, in this one constellation. Uh, if you don't have a, um, a telescope or you really want uh, to see some of these objects, there's no need to get upset and, and, and have a meltdown. Uh, you just uh, notify uh, Joe Lamb at rentals at dva.org, and he'd be happy to um, uh, rent you a telescope so you can at least to start to uh, embark on your journey uh, through the uh, Virgo constellation, the Virgo clusters, and then you can keep going into Coma and, and uh, other springtime galaxies. And Joe's not here, but you can contact him uh, through the website. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Well. Okay. Okay. So now it's time. Now it's almost time for our featured speaker. But first, we'd like to mention the upcoming talk. On June 2nd, we'll have Steve Kennard. He will be presenting new research that he's involved with from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. On July 7th, we have Bray Harris, who's going to talk about the history of celestial cartography. August 14th is our own Harold Goldner. Um, and it's going to be something involving literature and astronomy, but he has, we haven't pinned him down yet on the title. August 25th is our outdoor astronomy fair, fair and picnic. Yes, there will be food at Fort Washington State Park. And for those of you who haven't uh, been to one of these events, we start out uh, with some exhibits, um, outdoor exhibits um, around dinner time, And then we hang out uh, if, as long as it's a nice night and do some observing there right in Fort Washington uh, State Park. So it's usually a good time as long as the weather cooperates. And on September 22nd, we have John Conrad, who will be talking about the OSIRIS-REx asteroid sample return mission. They'll actually be getting the samples on the 24th of September. So this is really timely, very exciting. So that'll be a great talk. Oops, wrong direction. And now to the featured speaker. We have John Honka who will be speaking to us on how he designed, built, and how he observes with his 24-inch F3 Dobsonian telescope. I first met John about a month and a half ago, I think, at Blue Mountain, and I got to see his setup, which is amazing. Um, and he was just so generous with calling everybody in the field over to see it when he, when he would get something in uh, good in the view viewfinder. And the thing that I remember the best is um, the Horsehead Nebula, which was pretty amazing to see without, you know, through, through a viewfinder, eyepiece, whatever you call it. <laughs> so John built his first telescope at age 13 using an Edmund Scientific mirror grinding kit to make a six inch mirror. He used stove pipe for the tube and plumbing fixtures for the mount. John has been building larger telescopes and observing for over 50 years, and recently built a 24-inch scope, which is the topic of this talk. He mainly observes from his backyard, but also makes several trips each year to Blue Mountain Vista Observatory or Cherry Springs State Park for the darker skies and to share the views, which he does very generously. So now I'd like to introduce John, come in uh, and give us his talk. We, we'd like to ask you to, to hold the questions um, until the midway through his talk. The first part of his talk will be about building the telescope, and we'll take questions on that. And then the second part will be more the observations that he's done with the telescope, and we'll take questions after that. So, John, take it away. It's your microphone. I'm plugged in. Can, can you all hear me? Yes. I have to turn it up because we were getting feedback. 
you on the screen here. Try it again, John. Say hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. yeah. Say it again. Oh, it's on. Yeah. Uh, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, this one. So thanks for inviting me to talk about how I built my uh, built and observe with my 24 inch telescope. I, I, I like both telescope building and observing. I know Jan mentioned some some of some BVA, BVA members have looked through my scope at um, at Blue Mountain. For this for this presentation. First, I'm gonna do just a brief history of the scopes I've built leading up to this 24 inch. Then I'll talk about how I designed and built the 24 inch F4. Uh, I'm gonna go through some maybe unique ATM type features I put onto the scope. Uh, and then the second part, I'll go into how some of the regular observing I've done with it some of the night vision and also some video observing I do with an Allen cam. So um, so this this is the first oops, this is the first scope that um, I made after the six inch. It's an, an eight inch. I also ground the mirror for this scope. And uh, this this is back in the early to mid 80s when I was really getting into astrophotography. So you can see this mount. This is right in mid '80s when we moved into our house, and I actually built a 10 by 10 roll-off roof observatory in the backyard. Put in this huge, um, huge concrete pier, and built this mount. This is very homemade. Built with pillow block bearings on steel plates, and and um, you know I have a little Celestron comet catcher here attached, and that's how I guide it. Because back in those days, we didn't have digital photography. I used 35 millimeter camera, it was hyper sensitized tech pack and tech pen 2415 film. And, and I would guide 20 to 30 minutes manually. There's no auto guiding. I'm looking through an eyepiece reticle, punching the little buttons, and keeping that little star centered on there. And, and um, and I even developed my own film and printed my own photos back then. So I did that for a couple of years. And then, you know, then, then aperture fever kind of kicked in again. And, and I built this 12 and a half inch. This, by this time, you know, the Dobsonians were becoming more popular. And I think I copied this somewhat out of a Richard Berry telescope making book with the whole uh, you know, with all the plywood and it comes apart in a couple of pieces. And I actually did take this to a few places. It does come apart. On this one, I did buy the 12 and a half inch mirror. At this point, I stopped making my own mirrors. I just didn't have the time time to do it at that point. Um, that mirror actually came from Ed Beck of Enterprise Optics. He, he worked up through Cave Optical until it went out of business. And uh, it's a really fine mirror. So I, I use this for a... Uh, a, a few years. I just recently built turned turned this into a very um, very uh, portable scope with truss tubes that I can carry around easily without ramps or wheelbarrow handles because no part weighs more than 22 pounds. So it, it, it will live on. And then and then after the 12 and a half inch then, then aperture uh, fever hit again and this I built back in 1990, thereabouts. Um, back then, I was reading Telescope Magazine, Telescope Making Magazine, and Dave Creaky was starting to put articles out there about a 20 inch telescope he was building with truss tubes. So, this is really pretty much a clone of that. It's an 18 and a half inch. I worked with John Hall of Pegasus Optics, the late John Hall. And uh, it's an 18 and a half inch F4. I had to kind of twist his arm a bit back then to even go down to an F4 because we're going back to 1990. And um, but I then then have used this scope, uh, this picture of it up at Cherry Springs State Park. I've I've used this scope for about 20 
five years now, up, up until a few years ago. And uh, uh, back in 1999, I actually took this to the first Black Forest Star Party. And back then, the first one, they had a telescope making competition. So I entered it, and this actually won first prize in the large, large telescope uh, category. Um, at that time, I still had a homemade drive gear to track and homemade focuser, but the whole scope is made out of basically kind of converge. Uh, again, I was trying to simulate what an obsession was at a much, much cheaper price, and and, and I do like building my own scopes to uh, observe. Uh, and then, you know, then about four years ago, as I was approaching getting ready to retire, I figured it's one more shot at aperture fever. So that's when um, that's when I built my latest 24 inch. Um, this is back in, I think, September 19, the first time I had it out at Blue Mountain Vista Observatory. You can see it's a very low profile. My main goal here was to able to keep my feet on the ground as I age here I'm getting it's getting tired of going up ladders and and uh, and I was able to accomplish that um, this is this is my, I'm not taking it to a dark sky side this is now I got rid of the concrete pier in the eight inch and all of that it's where it, it, it now resides here when it's not somewhere like the cherry springs or two mountains and so this this is how I this is how I decided on on the 24 inch. You know, I wanted to get the largest aperture I could, but I had I had three goals here. I wanted to make sure that I said I keep keep my feet on the ground. I had to fit inside my 10 by 10 backyard observatory. That's where I still do a good bit of my observing, and it had to have a low f ratio because. We'll get to a little later the, the night vision image intensifier I use in the mount can work a lot better down down at the low low uh, f ratios where the image is brighter. So at this time, you know, the Paracore two is getting tested with f threes and getting good results, and I didn't really want to go above like a twenty five percent of obstruction for the secondary. So so for a few months I was. Designing this stuff out, you know, just on paper, sketching things out, you know, still came up with a very tight top tolerance between the rocker box and the mirror and the and, and the ground board, and um, you know, I was able to to fit a 24 inch at an F3 that it would still hit a 65 inch height that I wouldn't have to use um, any kind of step stool or anything. So that's how I ended up with the 24F3. Basically, it's the largest I could keep my feet on the ground with, and um, you know, some designing some very, very tight tolerances and keeping it very low profile. Um, now, there aren't many mirror makers that even will consider an F3. I, I tried a few, and I ended up with Gary Ostahoski in California. I talked to him at Lent, and you know, between guarantee of accuracy and price and being able to deliver on time. Um, you know, he, 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 he came through with all of that and, and, and also he made the mirror in the secondary out of quartz. So I don't have to worry quite as much about cool ENS one sixth the thermal delivery and time of Pyrex. So um, I was very happy. He actually produced the, probably a few, few weeks ahead of time. And, uh, Just because I'm a telescope making nut and that, I mean, I've, I've had him, you know, send me some of the pictures. This is when the, the blank came in, and he's uh, checking it for a kneel to make sure there's nothing wrong with it. It's basically a 64 pound piece of quartz with fused silica, and just a couple, you know, as he's grinding and polishing. Uh, there he's. Testing the curvature. We realize on an F3, the 24 inch, the center of the glass 
it has to take out over a half an inch of glass. So the center of the mirror is only one and a half inches thick. That's how steep the curve is on an F3. And uh, let's do some checking here to make sure the surface is coming out fine. For this, I also wanted to really make sure that, that I would um, be able to mount this properly and keep it collimated, especially at F3. So this this is you know, this is putting together my basement. This is all this is all one and a quarter inch stainless steel tubing. Uh, I, I took and had it welded. And you see all these different welds and stainless steel, the triangles. Um, the, the real some of the latest information coming out of mounts is really good. And these these are kind of unique here. What I did here was I, I found a metal company online that had a computer aided design program. So I was able to tell them exactly what I needed. So this fits around the bottom of the, the mirror. It's called the Whipple Tree Roller Bearing. And the mirror sits on these four nylon coated roller bearings. So I had these made and I drilled holes in the side and put these roller bearings in. This whole thing is made right in my base, as you can see. One thing I learned here is I use stainless steel so I wouldn't have to worry about rust. I'll, I'll never do that again. I went through probably two sets of drill bits and and uh, it's just a, a saw blade. It's just really hard to work with, but I do not. At least I don't have to worry about rust now, but uh, it's very strong. And this is what it looks like. You, know, you can see here the, the mirror is sitting down here. And what this does is a lot of them, and even my 18 and a half inch was on a swing, and the mirror would always tend to slide back and forth over the night, and I'd be readjusting a collimation. This doesn't move anywhere. I can take this to Cherry Springs, even drive four and a half hours through those roads. I come there and I just have to make the slightest adjustment and I can get the laser right back in the center. And I test it through the night, swinging the scope around, looking at things, and it, it, it just keeps it right in. So I'm really happy the way this, this worked out and no signs of astigmatism or anything else. because. This is a two inch thick mirror, but even there, that's still kind of on the thin side for a 24 inch. And this, if anybody wants to make a telescope, I highly recommend this book by Dave Creevy and Richard Berry. I, I didn't have this when I made the 18 and a half inch. I was using just his early telescope making for articles and that, but this book is really good. I just did a lot of stuff in paper figuring out like where the focus report goes. You can see some of the parts here before I put it together with the triangles, the supports, you know, roller bearings. Um, this is the upper tube gauge assembly. And again, this is, I did this whole thing in a basement in an area about eight by 10 feet. So I used the table saw and basically hand, hand tools. Um, this is all made out of Baltic birch. I I use double thickness, so I could really put a lot of pressure or a lot of tightness on these veins. Because again, with this scope, it, it has a six-inch secondary mirror, which is on, on the heavy side. And, and at an F3, I was really concerned that I had to keep this collimated properly for the whole night. And this really, really held, held up well. It, the, uh, this is actually close up of the, the uh, six and secondary mirror. You can see I have like a half inch offset in here. This all came from Astro Systems. And uh, he actually recommended that I, uh, that I put these double thickness, these double thickness um, struts in here to hold it because it, it can absorb about four times as much uh, pressure is, is the aluminum tubes that are commonly used. So I have a lot of, a lot of, um, these are very tight and this is, they're really rigid, but again, it does have to hold in. 
it's very hard, you know, secondary mirror. And then there's a there's a shot of it being that's that's the area I'm working in there. And just paid a lot of attention to uh, you know to make sure I was getting all the angles and everything as close as I could so the digital setting circles would work well. And this and again, I don't have a professional shop or anything, so when it came time to do this, it was out in the backyard where I'm doing all the stain and sealing. I ended up putting, I think, about six coats of polyurethane on here to make sure it held up on all the do that you get. And you can see here too how how low profile this rocker box is. It's only a few inches above the base, and you know, I cut out as much as I could of the inside to keep the weight down. On the uh, one thing on the ground board, the one one thing I used on here, which I also used on the eighteen and a half inch, is I routed out on the two of the points. I use Teflon on one point. On the other two points, I just have a bracket here with three or three uh, roller bearings, and that's how I do my azimuth. Is you know, when I'm near the zenith, it's so much easier to be able to pull something. Three pieces of Teflon never work from where you want the FRP board and all that stuff on there. This has a really nice, uh, really nice adjusting. Uh, Feel to it, it stops right when it's supposed to. And um, it just worked really well for that. And and also, I, I could then use uh, a nice piece of very smooth for mica so I can make tracks. So I don't get any kind of bumpiness from, from any more rib type of material sometimes use. And, and I use this again on the 24 inch because with the with the tracking, this is a servo track. This, this is what you can do with a. I think the roller bearings here helped us out a lot. This was back in 2010, Perry Springs State Park. This is just a straight prime focus, and it, I used the Canon DSLR right from off shelf from Best Buy. Ran it for 30 seconds, no guiding or anything else. And, and, and you can see the stars are not too much, uh, they look pretty pretty good here. And uh, this is just one single unprocessed image. So this is something I want to do more of when I get a chance right now. I managed to get up there. I uh, tend to just observe in that. But uh, this was one night, I think it was a very cold night, like three in the morning. And, 27 degrees, but Orion is pretty high up there in October. And uh, but that's uh, that's 30 30 seconds unguided with a servo pad. And a couple of the ATM features that I'm uh, using. Now, the band is pretty common in the back, but I spend a lot of time working working with these springs to get the right tension blend. And, because I like to do a lot of high power observing, especially with the planets and that. When I had this mounted, more traditional plastic material, you know, on here, I just I could pick up vibrations at four or five hundred power. Not great ones, but I could see them. With this, I can go up to. I've already had this up over a thousand power, and I can't even see the slightest uh, slightest vibration. Now, the second one, maybe more unique, is. I put in three squirrel cage bands. Yeah. These are each about seven. I'm not sure anybody else does this. I, I, these are each about seven inches across. You know, they're squirrel cages all in the air. And, and I have a half inch slit cut out underneath here. And you can see in the next slide. Um, you know, as the air spins around, it puts out a half inch sheet of air about 24 inches across. And if I have this mounted, so it goes right down 
over the top of the mirror and comes out of the bottom where it's open. So I've got the back fan going, bringing up air here. I got this coming down and this is that like cross flow ventilation. So it's early in the night, I run these at full speed. I, I put a control in there so that I can help get the scope acclimated. But then once it's acclimated, then I tend to, uh, to bring it down to a very low speed. So it's just putting a little bit of air off the front of the mirror just so I can get any, even though the seeing is good, you can still get a lot of uh, a lot of air sitting over the top of the mirror that distorts the image. I, I do like to look at planets too with this, and that's where it's especially useful. But uh, this is another one where they're very crudely built, but I spent a lot of time, you know, reworking and bending springs around until I found uh, a combination here. You need these three squirrel cage fans are just mounted on a half inch piece of, um, of uh, aluminum. But I finally got to the point that I can look at a planet at eight, nine hundred power and just start tests over a thousand, and I don't get any sun, any vibration unless I have it maybe at the highest speed, which I wouldn't be using if I'm doing that. But uh, so that's one thing that uh, has worked well, and it really does help cool the mirror down early in the evening too, and it helps blow any dust off that's on the mirror too. <laughs> Um, and then there's one, the one, one thing I didn't count on was how heavy this upper tube assembly was going to be between a six inch secondary and that heavier build upper tube uh, um, plywood and, and just everything. The, the upper tube weighs 35 pounds without any eyepieces in it. And I didn't, at first I thought, you know, it's not going to be a big deal. The scope told me I'm only going up like that high to, uh, to look at it. But, um, but trying to lift 35 pounds up at night and kind of levitate it over a 24 inch telescope and have it come down nicely on those four little truss bolts that are sitting there. Uh, and I, I figured that was just an accident happening. That's going to happen to me or, or the telescope. So what I did here is I I got the router out again and made one more ring set here, which I mount permanently, you know, which I have the the upper two mounts on. Uh, and then you can't really see it here, but I you know there's obviously this isn't going to sit like this by itself because it's a lot more weight here it is than here. So I have a a rope nylon rope tied here holding it down. And then on the upper one, where this used to get attached directly to, to the trusses, now, now I have uh, some angle brackets I made out of aluminum. So now I just have to lift this, the upper tube assembly just a foot or two up, move it over, and it just latches right on there. And then I use you know, a couple of I use four bolts then in the field just to, to tighten it on. And, and again, this whole collimation really well. So uh, so that that's how I worked around that kind of unanticipated <laughs> issues. So, because I do want to be able to set this up myself in the field. If you had two people, it's no problem. But a lot of times I'm setting this up and taking it down on my own. I tend to usually be one of the last people to leave Blue Mountain, so I'm usually taking it apart myself. And then this, besides being a mirror box cover, I also filled in you know, this. And, and you know, with a 24 inch mirror and a six inch secondary, you know, I've got essentially a nine inch unobstructed reflector between you know, 24 inches. The radius of the mirror is 12 inches. The radius is six in secondary is three. So 12 minus nine is 12, 12 minus three is, is nine. And, and so I essentially have a nine inch F8 focal and doesn't change uh, unobstructed reflector. And, and I don't use this very much, but, but like in, back in winter when we had the, uh, you know, Mars was at opposition weather scene was never great and I didn't want to miss that 
I'd much rather observe full aperture, but there were some nights where that just wasn't working. And this actually gave me a really nice view. So, you know, I, I kind of have a built-in nine, nine inch F8, it's basically an apple. It's, it's an un, unobstructed reflector and don't have to worry about color. So I don't use it much, but it really does work well when something is happening like the Mars opposition and I really want to see it and the scene is cooperating. And this is what I use for my mirror cover. Again, with the price of coating these days, I'm trying to keep the, the coating as long as I can. So this is actually you know, a big piece of clear plexiglass that I had made one quarter inch thick. And it just fits right over the mirror because the mirror has you know the little beveled edge on it. So I'm not really touching it with the coating. It's sitting right up in the beveled edge. Uh, I put this wooden handle in the center just to make it easier to um, to lift in and out. And then this this is um, a little humidifier that I uh, can plug in when it gets exhausted, like when this turns green, that means it's absorbed all the moisture. I plug it in overnight and I can use it again because I, I keep this again in my observatory, which is you know, it's not heated or climate controlled or anything. I've yet to ever notice any kind of uh, condensation forming on this. And then, you know, un underneath it, I just really hard to work with this plexiglass. So I just Really do one and a half inch holes enough that uh, enough that it, it fits over the opening on the back. So all I'm really doing is exposing this to the one half inch of, of mirror that's exposed under the plexiglass, and it's taking any condensation form off of there. And I find about every two months this will turn green. I plug it in overnight and, and I'm good for two months again. And I leave this in when I take it in the, uh, the vehicle, to like Black, the Blue Mountain or, or up to Cherry Springs. So if I'm bringing it back, I don't have to worry that there's a lot of condensation up there. And, um, so that's what I do for that. And then just one more, um, one more piece. Uh, I noticed maybe with the weight distribution at the telescope, you got zero horizontal 90. When it starts going below 45 degrees heading to the horizon, it, it tends to get top heavy. And if I'm using vinyl viewers, some heavier eyepieces, uh, it starts dropping down. So this is just a little, again, I experimented with a spring spring here and tried a lot of different things, but I got this set up so around 45 degrees it started engaging and the further down I go, the more the scope gets top heavy, the more spring is engaged and backs it off. So I really don't have to worry about putting extra weights on the back or anything else. So I can go literally horizontal and still have a 21 millimeter ethos eyepiece in there with a power cord and not have the scope bottoming out on me and I don't have to put extra weight in the back. So uh, so that was the uh, that was the last little kind of feature I put on here. So uh, maybe uh, maybe we'll take a break at this point and uh, before it, the second part I'm gonna go through how I observe in different ways, regular eyepieces, night vision and and video, but Maybe now, if you have any questions on the telescope building part. Sure, that's great. We'd like to have you use the microphone if you have a question so that the people uh, on YouTube will be able to hear. So, anyone? John, what happened to the other telescope that you made? What happened to that telescope, other telescope? Well, the, the 18 and a half inch is sitting in my garage. I figured one day I'm not going to be able to move this thing around anymore. I'll be, you know, then I'll go probably back to the 18 and a half inch, which is still a fine scope and just keep this in the backyard. I still have the eight inch in the basement and I still occasionally bring it out, which a much, a much, uh, smaller mount the other mount i think weighed 150 pounds so i don't deal with that anymore that's still sitting in my basement too <laughs> and uh and uh 
So I still have, and, and that little Celestron Comet catcher that I bought way back when to use as a guide scope is still something I use, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that more with the night vision too. But um, uh, but I haven't given any of them up. Uh, so, but I don't use many now except for the 24 inch. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you for your detail. I really appreciate it. Um, this is more like more use than manufacturing, but is there some way to say it that AUKUS uh, star party that it's actually looks through this? I don't know if there's something where you don't take it out very often. It'd be interesting to see actually what you can see through it. Yeah, I, I get to, uh, the more I have it out, I, I get to. Blue Mountain Vista Observatory, probably four or five, six times a year. Cherry Springs, usually once or twice a year. Uh, it's just that that's much further away, and I try to make sure there's two nights before I go all the way out there. I guess they'd like to know how can we find out when you're observing? Oh, when? Well, I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't. So uh, we can join you. Uh, well, I, I, I do post out on the. <laughs> I post that on the chess bot group, which you, you aren't, aren't familiar with. Um, um, Would you be willing to send me an email and I'll let people know? Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your uh, question uh, exactly. You know, it's always a kind of a last minute decision because of weather. Y right? Yeah. I, many, many times with Blue Mountain Vista, I'm, I make that decision at one o'clock, pack the scope up, and I'm there at five or six o'clock because the weather as you know is hard to uh, hard to predict uh, um, but uh, but yeah whenever I if, if I ever get a little bit of advance notice I'll, I'll certainly let you know because um, as, as you know I when I go out I observe alone a lot my, a lot so when I go out I'm happy to share the views with everyone you know? Great presentation, John. And I, and like Jan, thank you for being generous with your eyepieces because I had the good fortune of setting up next to you right. three, probably three times up in right. Franks. Right. And, um, and, uh, and it's always been a real pleasure. Um, the question I have is with the um, weight of the uh, secondary cage assembly, did you have to add any additional weights uh, to the mirror box or was the uh, structure of the um, you know, of the actual mirror cell and stuff enough to, to offset that weight? Uh, no, it, it wasn't. Even though the mirror itself weighs 64 pounds, um, between that heavy upper tube assembly and, and the fact that it's short, so you're not getting that large yeah. fulcrum, I have about 25 pounds of extra steel bars folded into the back of the okay. scope. Two of them Two of them I can unscrew when I move it around, so I'm not pushing all that up the ramps, making it even heavier than it is. Sure. One of them I have permanently on there, but yeah, I actually, um, it took me a while to to balance that out. Yeah, but, um, yeah. but yeah, it's it's um, a six inch secondary and that very heavy duty, extra heavy duty um, secondary spider. Um, that's that's a lot of I just. But my collimation stays perfect all night, so I'm I'm happy to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And plus, with the real low profile uh, mirror box, that yep. only adds to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I knew I was going to run into that. I wasn't sure how much I had calculated. Maybe ten or twelve pounds. It ended up being about twenty five pounds yeah. that I needed. Well, great, great job with it. I mean, as you know, being a part of the um, the. Uh, DBAA's ATM group for years when it existed, um, you know, we we would always have these kind of problems as our uh, challenges, and we would collectively put our heads together. And it's 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 really impressive what you've done. Yeah, yeah, it's really impressive. It's kind kind of fun. I mean, to to figure you know to find out like the surprises, like the upper weight of that, just stuff you don't think about ahead of time. Yeah, you know? and there's always something. Well, fantastic. Do we have any questions on YouTube? I'm not here, but I see. <clears throat> okay, anybody, any other ones before we go on to the next half of the time? Uh, 
when the mirror is in itself, uh, is the bottom edge supported just by those four points, the nylon coated bearings? Uh, the bottom, yeah. yeah. And then okay. just the 18, uh, you know, the 18 points on the pad above it, that's that's it. And I've yet to find any astigmatism or any issues. And uh, um, I didn't think of the Whipple tree myself. That's something I read that John, John Astrocraft does that. Um, and, and, uh, but uh, I've read a lot about it. It makes a lot of sense. And I was really trying to get away from that sling that constantly moved back and back and forth. So uh, I was real happy with the way that worked out. Okay, let's let's see what this thing can do. All right, we'll go to observing next. So, got a couple go through a few, but just to set this up here. So, this is what some of you may recall seeing. This is my setup here at Blue Mountain. This the observatory to. Uh, to observe and uh, so so I, you know for for the regular eyepiece observing and and you know one of the reasons I also want to go to the 24 inches because I got almost a hundred percent light gathering power over the 18 and a half inch and you know I really do like to look at galaxies and galaxy clusters that's you know, I like the eye candy too, but but the uh, the galaxy clusters and those really faint objects are what I like quite a bit. So 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 far the faintest the faintest thing I've seen observed through here was up at Cherry Springs State Park. It was our three thirty in Draco. I had five galaxies in total. The fourth one was sixteen point six magnitude. You can see that pretty easily with an eight eight millimeter ethos and then the fifth galaxy was a 17.4 mag and it was coming out um in and out but it, it was there but not constantly so so right now from cherry springs on what was a really good night i've, I've gone to like 17.4 magnitude uh maybe someday if i ever get out to texas i'll, I'll even go higher but um, um and last month i was at Blue Mountain Vista, and I was able to see all seven galaxies in Copeland's septet with a 10 mil, with an eight millimeter ethos. And, um, you know, the final one was kind of faint, but they they were all there. And that was an average night. It probably wasn't the best night ever at, at uh, Blue Mountain. Uh, so, so those are some of the dim things. Now, the most distant object I've seen so far is is actually a quasar in Hercules that I observed at Blue Mountain Vista last fall. That if you look in Sky Safari is 8.6 billion with a B light years away. And I, I found this from an article that, that Alan Purdy wrote back in Sky and Telescope in 2018. It was called the uh, um, ancient photons from AGNs, active galactic nuclei. So that night I was looking for it. Al happened to be set up right aside of me at, at Blue Mountain Vista. So we observed it together and a couple other Chessmont observers were there who got to see it. I brought up my, uh, my sky safari on my iPad so I could get a, a view of it because it it only looks like a faint faint star i think it's a little past 15th magnitude but um uh, but we uh but i brought it up there so everybody can kind of identify the star field and uh and and we were we were all able to see it um uh, and to, to me it's it's mind-boggling to think that the photons that left that that quasar like it was 4 billion years before the earth was even formed and it's hitting our eyeballs there at Blue Mountain Vista. And yeah, that's the stuff that blows my mind. Uh, yeah. But uh, so that's that's to me the furthest thing. Now, are there, there are some further ones on that Alan Purdy article, so I'm not done yet, but, uh, but, but for now, that's as far as I've gone. Uh, and then of course, you know, I love the galaxy clusters and that, but I also love all all the uh, you know the bright stuff like the Ryan Nebula, seeing some of the 
the reds and the purples and on the outer parts of the nebula. You know, probably my favorite is, is the Veil Nebula with a 21 ethos and then with an O3 filter. And I know some of you have seen, definitely some BVAA members have seen that through my scope, I know. And then, you know, all, all the other things like seeing the center star in the ring, the M51, M82, M13, you know, the 24 just, just makes them look incredible. And, uh, and, you know, and at times just for fun, I'll do the, you know, the, I think they call it the stupid high power tricks where I'll, I'll put a couple of Barlow's on the 4.7 ethos and go to like 2200 power and look at the snowball nebula and see the detail. And then we did this a couple months ago at, at Blue Mountain when the scene was really good and, and, and the, uh, the Eskimo was just coming out. I, you could see the face there was popping out. Um, some of the other uh oh the cat's eye was just amazing when we had had a chance to see that and um you know the seeing has to be really good but I, I was still able to i'm always impressed with the optics that terry did even at 2200 power i was still able to get a decent focus on the stars and that and, and you know the moments of good seeing and just an, another neat way to observe not that i do that a lot but um uh, 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 so, all right, all right, now we'll go to, um, so that's, that's kind of the stuff I do with the regular eyepieces. Now it was about 15 years ago that I, uh, I kind of took a chance with this new device and image intensifier that it was a combination of uh, Russ at Denkmeyer, Denkmeyer Optics and Doug Baum at Night Vision Astronomy was developing and I had you know, I observed with Russ a number of times at Black Black Forest Star parties, you know, with his early bino viewers. So yeah, I was really interested in what he was coming up with. And and so I took a chance and 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 got one of those. There was only he made they were made between 2007 and 2009, and there was only about two dozen made. And um this this is what it looks like. Um, Basically, uh, and, and it, it works just like an eyepiece. All it has is an on-off switch, and and um, and 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 the, and the really neat thing about this is that, as some of you probably recall, looking at it, it has a very wide panoramic lens in the front. So it's a bino viewer, but it's not really a bino viewer. There's still only one large eyepiece. It's really technically a biocular, but you can use both eyes. But the nice thing is you don't have to worry about interpupillary and you don't have to focus because you're both eye, you don't have to have a separate focus for each, each side. So people can walk up to it. It's great for sharing views because you can just walk up to it and look into it. It's got almost infinite eye relief. You can stand back two feet. You know, I've had people looking in and people in back of them are looking at the same object that you, know, you can see it from a couple of feet back. So it's really just a really neat, and it's a shame they don't make them anymore. They, you know, they stopped making them around 2009 or 2010. I think one of the reasons was it was just, uh, they, they couldn't get this, this optical part anymore that had the big panoramic lens. Uh, but uh, you know, you, so, so there are other. You can buy other intensified eyepieces now, but they're all single for the most part. And and I really like the bino viewer aspect of this. So so just a little go back to this one. So just just a little, and, and I don't understand a whole lot about how these even work. Yeah, like a little bit of magic, but anyway, this is the part that goes into the telescope, just like an eyepiece, and just like an eyepiece has a field lens, this has an uh, image intensifier, has a lens here where the photons come in, you know, you know you've got the mirror and, and it's coming in, in, in here. Um, this image intensifier then takes those photons, turns them into electrons, amplifies them 50 to 60,000 times and then converts it back to uh, the light on a 
you know, that we can see on a phosphor screen. And um, this device has a green phosphor screen. That's why at times you're going to notice more of a greenish color to it. Some of the newer image intensifiers they have now actually, they have a white phosphor screen so that you can get away from some of the green image. But that's really what's going on here. The light's coming in, gets converted. This is where all the magic happens in here in the tube. It gets intensified, converted back. There's a little phosphor screen here. And then this big panoramic lens is really looking and, and, and magnifying that um, phosphor screen, just like an eyepiece does. And, and that's what allows us to, to see what we're seeing. Um, Beauty here is that this is all, as some of you probably know, this is all, all real time. You can focus with this. You don't need any tracking. And uh, and you know, before I get into some of the observing and, and also the ways I use, there's other ways to use this too. Uh, I can also attach this is an old Canon 200 millimeter um, telephoto lens, you know, before optical stabilization and all, all that good stuff. But with this then, I just hold it up to the sky and now I got something where I can put the entire Orion constellation in the field of view and see the horse head, the Orion nebula, and, and even the, uh, the rosette all in one field of view. So essentially, I'm no use. I'm not using the telescope anymore. It's now become a, a telephoto lens. And then, even if I want a wider field of view, I took an old 50 millimeter camera lens and put a little mound on here. I actually have some duct tape in here holding it, but but it works fine. And when that, when I hold that up, now you now you can put in about 20 degrees. You can get in incredible amount of sky and and with the right filters on here i can look in my backyard where, where i can't see the milky way at all in the south there's just too much light pollution i put this up there and, and it looks like i'm naked eye at cherry springs i mean i can see the the rifts and everything right down to the horizon and and i'm looking down you know, I'm about 25 miles, 30 miles north of here. I'm you know, looking down over Montgomeryville, some of this area over Philadelphia. So the southern part of my sky is not good. I occasionally can see the Milky Way a little bit above, but but not very well. But this will actually uh, bring out the Milky Way. It's great for seeing meteors too. I like meteor storms I've aimed it up there and some of the faint ones are shooting through that I wouldn't be able to see naked eye. Um, so, and, and so more in the observing part now like the biggest improvement in here is on the emission nebula where I can use a hydrogen alpha filter. Um, because the real the real trick to this, um, let me make sure I got this right here. You know, and, and I'll show you some photos that I've taken from my backyard in a minute that'll show what I'm talking about. But but the way this works is this it, it amplifies all the light, both from the nebula and from the light pollution, but it's doing it 60,000 times. But then I put extremely tight filters in there that you, you would use for CCD photography. I, I go down as low as a three millimeter, three nanometer uh, H-alpha filter, but typically I'm using more like a six nanometer. But what that does is it takes almost all the light pollution away, but it's, it's leaving that emission nebula coming through, which has been amplified 60,000 times. And, and, and when I put it in the scope like this, and that's what we're looking at, that's that's what you can see. That's from my back. This is not black forest. That's from my backyard, which on a good night is 5.5 naked eye magnitude overhead. Uh, it's, it's not a great sky. I can hardly even see the Milky Way anymore on the best nights, even a trace of it. But... Um, 
this is just a quick little iPhone approach. You know, this is not processed. This is not uh, stocked or anything like that. This is just like a whatever it is, a thousandth of a you know, hundredth of a second snapshot, right? This is pretty much what you're looking at now. When you go to Blue Mountain, a little darker, this will even look a little cleaner because you've got a little less light pollution there. So more of that emission nebula was coming out to begin with. So the amplified version is even brighter. When you go to Black Forest, it'll get even better, but there's not a huge difference. What I can see in my backyard, and this is one of the benefits of night vision, what I can see of the horse head in my backyard is not much different than what I can see with the night vision at, Ch at Cherry Springs. And it's better than anything I've seen anywhere in any big scope in any dark sky with a regular eyepiece. A uh, couple more uh, items you know, right nearby. I usually, if I show people a horse head, I usually go to the flame. And um, you know that 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 also almost has a three D effect in the center where the dark lane is coming through, when the dark lane kind of comes through, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 here's one that even even with like a thirty or forty inch telescope down down in Arizona, I mean it, this is the cone nebula. I mean, visually, it, it, it's almost impossible or incredibly faint to even see that through 30, 40 inch telescopes from the super dark skies. Yet I got this in my backyard with, with a snapshot through through my phone. It actually looks better, you know, when I'm looking through the, the, the night vision. Um, but this is what the combination of those of those. Um, narrow band filters combined with that amplification of light and and i also enjoy being able to look with both eyes a couple other things that's that's the sender right around the sender star in cygnus and some dark areas popping out i mean the more i don't have pictures of all of these but like the north american nebula looks incredible uh, uh, that's that's a shot of the uh, the Crescent Nebula in Cygnus. This is one people don't look at very much. It's the Jellyfish Nebula and um, right at the base of Gemini. And you can actually see even on here, some of the strands hmm. coming down. On, on a really good night at Blue Mountain, I mean, I was moving I moved the field of view over and, and I had strands coming down all, over three fields of, of view. Um, again, this is from my backyard, 5.5 5 overhead. And this, this is something that's literally impossible to see with a regular telescope, no matter how dark it is, no matter how large it is. This is the elephant trunk, the dark area inside the elephant trunk. And, and you can see that part trails all the way down here and, and it continues on down a bit. But but this is, I don't know of anybody that's ever seen this on a regular eyepiece on, on any size scope and, and any dark sky. And this is, <laughs> this is really an unusual one. It was, <laughs> This was like two years ago at um, at Blue Mountain. This is a cat's paw. They're very low, very low in the sky, below like Sagittarius and in Scorpio, Scorpio. And, and this at Blue Mountain, I had to. I was white waiting for this, and it was so low against the horizon. I only had about a ten minute window when it came between two of the trees down in the south. And I was literally on and sitting on the ground to look into the scope, but the picture doesn't do just to this. It even looks a lot better in, in, in the night vision, but the, the four paws and the nebulosity just jumps, jumps out. And uh, you know, it's one of my favorites, but it's really hard to see from this, this, this far north. 
this one doesn't look great, but I just wanted to point out again how how much a night vision can help in the light, my light polluted skies. I love the galaxies and the faint ones like Hope One Step Pet. As I mentioned earlier, I saw all seven of these from Blue Mountain. I think I was using a, an eight millimeter ethos. They weren't bright, but they were there. In my backyard, I, I can maybe see two, sometimes three of these, three of the brighter ones with a regular eyepiece, but with the night vision, you know, I've got the three here. I've got the three here, including this more elongated one, and I've got seven one up here. And I think this one is something like fifteen point two or something, but uh, you know, much much fainter than Stefan's quintet. If, if any of you are familiar with that, and this is a uh, this is right from my backyard. Uh, so again, that's the. Uh, the night vision doesn't do great on galaxies like M51 that have a, a face on that are more bluish than that, but any of the edge ons or when they're more point source, source sources like this, that they really it really does well. Um, this one, and, and I mentioned that 200 millimeter telephoto lens, he's holding it up here. That was common neowise from my backyard, very early evening, but. And you can see how it even picked some of the tail going all the way back through here. None of this was visible naked eye. I could just barely see the, uh, this part down in here. Uh, um, I, I have a lot of fun with the night vision, and it's you know, it's it's great when I you know it's great because it's very easy to share and have people look right into this without all kind of special adjustments or anything and. Uh, Now, now, the one thing that's always surprising me after using this 15 years, I don't even notice the green or any of the scintillation anymore because I just focus in on the object. So whenever somebody's looking at it for first, I mean, oh, it's green, it's scintillating and reminds me, oh, that's right, that's what I used to see too. But um, uh, but so it is there because again, at 50,000 amplification, you're magnifying any dust, dirt, humidity, I tend not to use it a lot in the real humid conditions because that really does make the scintillation more. But um, but they also have the white phosphor now, which is starting to become available, which gets away from a little bit of the green. But uh, like I said, over time, I, I don't even notice the green anymore. And they say the contrast is actually better with, with the green phosphor. Um, All right, so that's that's those are my kind of adventures that I've been doing with the, the night vision and and uh, um, all the modern technologies are now single eyepiece. Um, yeah, the question was all, are all the technologies now single eyepiece. They pretty much are. They still make something called a PVS7 that actually is military and has two separate eyepieces, but it's like a bin bino viewer. You have to adjust the interpupil area, you have to adjust the individual eyepieces. And there are a lot of plastic lenses in it. So uh, not sure how good the quality is, but other than that, I'm not aware of any other binocular type type devices. The rest are single eyepieces. Most of them now, as you may have seen some ads by Teleview, most of them now are putting it actually on top of another eyepiece that goes into the telescope called a focal. But I, everything I'm doing is prime focus. The light from the scope goes right into the image intensifier what they're doing a lot now is putting the image intensifier with an adapter on top of an eyepiece. So now you're adding in a lot more glass into it, but, but and using like a 67 millimeter eyepiece to try to get a wider field of view. That's some of the newer technology that they're bringing in a white phosphor. I, I've looked through that. I've actually had one of those in a scope that someone has bought re recently. Um, 
uh, I, I still like the Bino View review, uh, but but they are good, and that's what's available now, and uh, which is certainly pretty amazing. It does all the same stuff with the H alpha filters, and you can see all of this. Hey, Bill, um, I was curious what uh, the power source is for that. Night vision. It's two, 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 two double A batteries. <laughs> they're, uh, they're, they're sitting right on the top of the binder view or right below that on off switch. So that's all. There's no wires, nothing. It, you just turn it on and off. And the batteries, well, actually, I put lithium batteries now. The regular batteries would go 40 or 50 hours. The lithium I've had in now for a long time and they're still running. So, yeah, so there's no uh, power, is not, not an issue. And, you can move it in and out just like an eyepiece. A lot of times I'll flip one out and put an eyepiece in to compare a view. Even it's, it's that easy. As long as I never noticed the cord. Yeah. yeah. Sort of well, we'll we'll get to a cord next when when I go to my video observing. Yeah. What what is the reason for the the hydrogen alpha? I mean, why why do you use the hydrogen alpha? Well, because because when 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 this. When, when this image intensifier is amplifying things like 60,000 times, it's amplifying the nebula coming through, but it's also magnifying all the light pollution. So all you get is a bright nebula, but the light pollution would be just as bright as the nebula, you wouldn't see anything. The hydrogen alpha filter, very narrow band, basically cuts out all the light pollution but not that band that's, that the emission nebula is emitting in. So now you amplified that 60,000 times. You got rid of the light pollution. That's why you can see the horse head nebula from my backyard. It's, it's the combination of the filters getting rid of the light pollution as well as that amplification. And that's why the galaxies don't look quite as well because you can't use a hydrogen alpha filter in galaxies because it would take too much of the light spectrum away. You know, you need a broader band filter. I use a, in the backyard, I use a filter that's like 35, much, much wider. So it's leaving a lot more of the light pollution in, but enough that I can still see Copeland septet, all seven members, where I can see it with a regular eyepiece. There's always a trade offs even on that, but um, but it's really the the filters in combination with the amplification. That's really the the magic in all of this. You know? And you know, some people, not everybody likes it. Some people still want to see just an object coming out of an eyepiece. I mean, I I've observed a lot of years, so for me anymore, it's like, what can I see the best? You know, if I can see the horse head. I don't care if I'm looking at a phosphor screen as long as it's live or almost live. Um, you know, like... Okay, we got. I got one last part here on video right. observing here. And, and uh, So just, just to kind of summarize again with the night vision, we got real time, we don't need tracking, there's no wires, there's just a little battery in there and on and off switch. Um, um, but we do have some of the green phosphor and the scintillation, that, that sort of thing. Um, and the other key thing is it doesn't show color. So you can look at the ring nebula and it's always going to be white or greenish, it's never gonna be a color. So it was about 18 years ago that I, I experimented with a Malin cam, which is a video type observing. It's, it's a camera. It's this, this setup right here. So it looks just like a camera, but what it, what it does is, you know, it amplifies the image, but it also shows color in objects, and it also brings out all types of galaxies, not, not just like the ones with dark edges and that which the night vision is good for. 
the night vision, I don't know, an image, but by the way, the night vision does a great job in the sombrero and 891, those dark lanes come through because it picks up the infrared in those, in those areas. Uh, but with video observing with the Malin cam, the downside is you need tracking, there's power cables, there's, um, um, you know, I just put a power cable through the scope, but then you need cables. And right now I have three, I have three monitors set up, a little four inch one here that's real close to the eyepiece so I can, I can focus and, and find objects. And then this CRT monitor here and this much bigger Sony one down here are also hooked up with SB, S video cables. This is still old technology, but, but the nice thing is I don't have to use a computer. And what I'm doing here is basically exposing for about five seconds and every five seconds, the image refreshes and I'm not stacking anything for those five seconds. The camera is built to stack its images on there and build them up in that show it. But every five seconds, that's what I'm using. I'll get a brand new image on there. So it's not like I'm looking at a photograph that's been stacked over 10 or 20 times or anything. Uh, now I could go, I could go longer. I could expose 5, 20, 30, 40, 50 seconds, but then I'm getting back into photography. And that's not what I'm trying to do. This is real time. I call it almost real time observing because I'm um, getting updated images every, you know, every four seconds. And that, that's just, you know, again, you can see I've got the power cable. I've got one cable running up here to the one monitor and another cable that splits down here to the two uh, the two monitors down here. In, in, in my older age here, as it gets colder, I've actually I've actually taken this monitor inside by the back of the house. We have a warmer sunroom area and I put a hundred foot SVSS S video cable into there and, and I use a sky safari with the wireless um, iPad and I can actually move the telescope around. I have exposure controls and I can actually sit inside my warmer room and be moving the telescope around and actually looking at the images coming through on, on the screen. Um, so these, these are, make sure I can cover everything here. So, so typically, I only do this in the backyard because I do have to be set up with power and have monitors and that, but I don't really need laptops or anything. I technically could take it in the field and just use this, but um, I don't really care to do that. Um, so now I'm going to show you some, some, these are just some images I've taken, again, from my backyard, 5.5 magnitude. These are just images I've taken either off of. Uh, You know, I just used again my iPhone to take snapshots off of this one or this one, and this this is what uh maybe we turn the lights down again it would be good. Thank you. So that's that's what the from Allen Cam brings out. That's a five second exposure, you know, with the dumbbell, and the color just pops out. I'm not I'm not processing anything at all. All I'm doing is adjusting two analog knobs in the monitor, the brightness and the contrast. I don't do anything else. There's no processing. This is a quick little iPhone snap, snapshot right off of the, uh, the monitor. Again, it looks a lot better if you're looking at it real. And again, if I'm out in the observatory there, I'm seeing this on three different screens. You know, so sometimes it looks better in a big one. The smaller one seems to have better uh, darkness to it. I can get a little darker background, uh, but no computers or anything else. Just the why the, the cables, video cables going from the camera to the monitor, and that's it. Um, there's, there's a ring number again, five seconds, and I'm getting the second star inside the ring. And when you're looking at this, this is updating every five seconds. So I, I kind of call it almost real time observing. It's not as real, it's not real time like the BIF, but but I'm also getting color and and then this is something that BIF can't do. Five seconds, 
and I can get that. Again, I could go 30 or 40 seconds and drop the game down and get a nice photograph, but and that's not what I'm trying to do. This um, I'm just doing doing like actual what I call almost real time observing. There's there's great on these 891 as you see 891 dark lane just pops out as one of my favorite galaxies. This looks really good on the fifth too, but not as good as this. There's the uh, crab nebula. You can almost see a little bit of maybe a little bit of the pinkish red coming out around here. And Again, if I was wanted to do long term long exposure photography, I could do that, but that's you know there's better ways to do that. Um, this is M64. Uh, you know, look at you almost get like a 3D effect here. I'm not even sure I had this completely focused here. Um, and and it, again, it comes from my backyard. And then like I said I like to go after really, really um, faint nebula in that, and I can't always get to black up to cherry springs to do that. So you know, here, here's one where um, again five second exposure, refreshing constantly. You got the Siamese, and I even have a um, a 17.9 magnitude galaxy showing up. The pair of 16 so almost look bright. This is one where I'm going into Sky Safari. These are some galaxies that are two and three billion light years away. Look at this one up here, 17 point, you know, basically 18th magnitude from my backyard. And it's actually showing up on the screen and it looks better in person. But there they are. And look how bright M66 is. This is again, five, five second exposure. Of the uh, of that triplet down in Leo, you know this is thirty six twenty eight that edge on, uh, and you know, I really love to look at these where I get a bright galaxy and then and then a real faint one up here. And there's another seventeen point eight comes through pretty pretty clearly. And when I was down here, I, I always was fascinated you know, fascinated with the quasars and black holes, you know. And, uh, the quite the galaxies with the black holes and uh, you know, and that jet and M87. So this is one I took five seconds. I'm pretty sure when I oriented this, this is where the jet should have been, but I'm pretty sure that that, that five second exposure from my backyard, I'm actually getting the jet coming out of M87. So this this technology here with the uh, I can't I've tried many times with the BIF I cannot see a jet with the BIF even at, at Cherry Springs, uh, but it does come through the video observing. So this gives me a chance to do some of my what I enjoyed is real real faint galaxy observing right from my backyard. And that's the end of my presentation. So any any follow up questions? Be happy to try to answer. Okay, do we have anything on YouTube? Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Have you uh, thought about opening a YouTube channel? Yeah. The, the YouTube beat was the best that I've seen on that YouTube. And you make some money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, now that I'm retired, you know, who, who knows? I mean, I, I, I know the Mellencamp group does do some live night vision where you can log on and people are actually losing their scope and you can log on and watch them as they move from Galaxy. And at some point I may try to do that since, you know, I can I can see this stuff pretty well. And uh, <laughs> but uh, but but yeah, I, I wouldn't rule that out. But, uh, Right now, I'm 
only had the scope for like three and a half years, so I'm still playing with it a lot, but I'll, I'll get to some more things with it. Jim? Okay. Can you see Pluto? Mm. Oh, yeah, I've, I've seen Pluto with, you know, even with the 18 and a half inch. There again, it's just a matter of getting a good star chart, and or I, I'll look at my sky safari, and if you can identify the star field, um, yeah, I, I've seen Pluto. I love looking at the planets like Uranus, Neptune. You can see the disks and that. Uh, said I had it, but Pluto again. It's, it's neat to say I've seen it, but it looks like a star. Okay, thank you so much, John. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was so interesting. And uh, I also wanted to say that I really wanted to thank John Gruber for, for stepping in uh, with technical assistance at the meeting and give him a hand. <laughs> Jeremy Carlo, who's our program chair, is out uh, with a sick relative uh, tonight. So John stepped in at the very last minute, and I think he did an awesome job. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, everyone. So. Um, come see us on the 27th of May. Uh, join us for the Valley Forge Star Party. And we'll be back in this room June 2nd for another of our regular monthly meetings. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Good night. Oh, we have to sing. Yeah. 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 Thank you.